Dubliners by James Joyce. Story 12. Ivy Day in the Committee Room. Old Jack raked the cinders together with a piece of cardboard and spread them judiciously over the whitening dome of coals. When the dome was thinly covered, his face lapsed into darkness, but as he set himself to fan the fire again, his crouching shadow ascended the opposite wall, and his face slowly re-emerged into light. It was an old man's face, very bony and hairy. The moist blue eyes blinked at the fire, and the moist mouth fell open at times, munching once or twice mechanically when it closed. When the cinders had caught, he laid the piece of cardboard against the wall, sighed, and said, "'That's better now, Mr. O'Connor.' Mr. O'Connor, a gray-haired young man, whose face was disfigured by many blotches and pimples, had just brought the tobacco for a cigarette into a shapely cylinder, but when spoken to he undid his handiwork meditatively. Then he began to roll the tobacco again meditatively, and after a moment's thought decided to lick the paper. "'Did Mr. Tierney say when he'd be back?' he asked in a sky falsetto. "'He didn't say.' Mr. O'Connor put his cigarette into his mouth and began to search his pockets. He took out a pack of thin, pasteboard cards. "'I'll get you a match,' said the old man. "'Never mind. This'll do,' said Mr. O'Connor. He selected one of the cards and read what was printed on it. "'Municipal Elections. Royal Exchange Ward.' "'Mr. Richard J. Tierney, P.L.G., respectfully solicits the favor of your vote and influence at the coming election in the Royal Exchange Ward. Mr. O'Connor had been engaged by Tierney's agent to canvass one part of the ward, but, as the weather was inclement and his boots led in the wet, he spent a great part of the day sitting by the fire in the committee room on Wicklow Street with Jack, the old caretaker. They had been sitting thus since the short day had grown dark. It was the 6th of October, dismal and cold out of doors. Mr. O'Connor tore a strip off the card, and lighting it, lit his cigarette. As he did so, the flame lit up a leaf of dark, glossy ivy, the lapel of his coat. The old man watched him attentively, and then, taking up the piece of cardboard again, began to fan the fire slowly while his companion smoked. "'Ah, yes,' he said, continuing, "'it's hard to know what way to bring up children. Now, would think he'd turn out like that. I sent him to the Christian brothers, and I had done what I could him, and then he goes boozing about. I tried to make him some way decent. He replaced the cardboard wearily. Only, I'm an old man now. I change his tune for him. I take the stick to his back and beat him while I could stand over him, as I had done many a time before. The mother, you know, she cooks him this and that. "'That's what ruins children,' said Mr. O'Connor. "'To be sure it is,' said the old man. "'And many thanks you get for it, only impudence. "'He takes the upper hand of me whenever he sees I have a sup taken. "'What's the world coming to when sons speak that way to their fathers?' "'What age is he?' said Mr. O'Connor. Nineteen, said the old man. "'Why don't you put him to something?' "'Sure amped and never done at the drunken bowsy ever since he left school?' I won't keep you, I says. You must get a job for yourself. But, sure, it's worse whenever he gets a job. He drinks it all. Mr. O'Connor shook his head in sympathy, and the old man fell silent, gazing into the fire. Someone opened the door of the room and called out, Hello, is this a Freemason's meeting? Who's that? said the old man. What are you doing in the dark? asked a voice. Is that you, Hines? asked Mr. O'Connor. "'Yes. What are you doing in the dark?' said Mr. Hines, advancing into the light of the fire. He was a tall, slender young man with a light brown moustache. Imminent little drops of rain hung at the brim of his hat, and the collar of his jacket coat was turned up. "'Well, Matt,' he says to Mr. O'Connor, "'how goes it?' Mr. O'Connor shook his head. The old man left the hearth, and after stumbling about the room returned with two candlesticks— which he thrust one after the other into the fire and carried to the table. A denuded room came into view, and the fire lost all its cheerful color. The walls of the room were bare, except for a copy of an election address. 
in the middle of the room was a small table on which papers were heaped mr hines leaned against the mantelpiece and asked has he paid you yet not yet said mr o'connor i hope to god he'll not leave us in the lurch tonight mr hines laughed oh he'll pay you never fear he said i hope he'll look smart about it if he means business said mr o'connor what do you think jack said mr hines satirically to the old man the old man returned to his seat by the fire saying it isn't but he has it anyway not like the other tinker what other tinker said mr hines colgan said the old man scornfully is it because colgan's a working man you say that what's the difference between a good honest bricklayer and a publican eh hasn't the working man as good a right to be in the corporation as any one else ay and a better right than those shoeings that are always hat in hand before any fellow with a handle to his name isn't that so matt said mr hines addressing mr connor i think you're right said mr o'connor one man is a plain honest man with no hunker sliding about him he goes in to represent the labor classes this fellow you're working for only wants some job or other of course the working classes should be represented said the old man the working man said mr hines gets all kicks and no halfpence but its labor produces everything the working man is not for looking for fat jobs for his sons and nephews and cousins the working man is not going to drag the honor of dublin in the mud to please a german monarch how's that said the old man don't you know they want to present an address of welcome to edward rex if he comes here next year what do you want kowtowing to a foreign king our man won't vote for the address said mr o'connor he goes in on the nationalist ticket won't he said mr hines wait till you see whether he will or not i know him is it tricky dicky tyranny by god perhaps you're right joe said mr o'connor anyway i wish he'd turn up with the spondulix the three men fell silent the old man began to rake more cinders together mr hines took off his hat shook it and then turned down the collar of his coat displaying as he did an ivy leaf in the lapel if this man was alive he said pointing to the leaf we'd have no talk of an address of welcome that's true said mr o'connor musha god be with them times said the old man there was some life in it then the room was silent again then a bustling little man with a snuffling nose and a very cold ears pushed in the door he walked over quickly to the fire rubbing his hands as if he intended to produce a spark from them no money boys he said sit down here mr henchy said the old man offering his chair oh don't stir jack don't stir said mr henchy he nodded curtly to mr hines and sat down on the chair which the old man vacated did you serve ongier street he said to mr o'connor yes said mr o'connor beginning to search his pockets for memoranda did you call on grimes i did well how does he stand he wouldn't promise he said i won't tell anyone what way i'm going to vote but i think he'll be all right why so he asked me who the nominators were and i told him i mentioned father burke's name i think it'll be all right mr henchy began to snuffle and to rub his hands over the fire at a terrific speed then he said for the love of god jack bring us a bit of coal there must be some left the old man went out of the room it's no go said mr henchy shaking his head i asked the little shoe boy but he said oh now mr henchy when i see work going on properly i won't forget you you may be sure mean little tinker usha how could he be anything else what did i tell you matt said mr hines tricky dicky tyranny he's as tricky as they make em said mr henchy he hasn't got those little pig's eyes for nothing blast his soul couldn't he pay up like a man instead of oh now mr henchy i must speak to mr fanning i've got lots of money mean little schoolboy of hell i hope he forgets the time his little old father kept the hand-me-down shop in mary's lane but is that a fact asked mr o'connor god yes said mr henchy did you never hear that and the men used to go in on sunday morning before the houses were open to buy a waistcoat or trousers moya but tricky dicky's little old father always had a tricky little black bottle up in a corner 
Do you mind now? That's that. That's where he first saw the light. The old man returned with a few lumps of coal, which he placed here and there on the fire. That's a nice how do you do, said Mr. O'Connor. How does he expect us to work for him if he won't stump up? I can't help it, said Mr. Henchy. I expect to find the bailiffs in the hall when I go home. Mr. Hines laughed, and, shoving himself away from the mantelpiece with the aid of his shoulders, made ready to leave. "'It'll be all right when King Eddie comes,' he said. "'Well, boys, I'm off for the present. See you later. Bye-bye.' He went out of the room slowly. Neither Mr. Henchy nor the old man said anything. But, just as the door was closing, Mr. O'Connor, who had been staring moodily into the fire, called out suddenly, "'Bye, Joe!' Mr. Henchy waited a few minutes, and then nodded in the direction of the door. "'Tell me,' he says across the fire, "'what brings our friend in here? What does he want?' "'Usha, poor Joe,' said Mr. O'Connor, throwing the end of his cigarette into the fire. "'He's hard up, like the rest of us.' Mr. Henchy snuffled vigorously, and spat so copiously that he nearly put out the fire, which uttered a hissing protest. "'I'll tell you my private and candid opinion,' he said. I think he's a man from the other camp. He's a spy of Colgan's, if you ask me. Just go around and try and find out how they're getting on. They won't suspect you. Do you twig? Ah, poor Joe is a decent skin, said Mr. O'Connor. His father was a decent, respectable man, Mr. Henchy admitted. Poor old Larry Hines. Many a good turn he did in his day. But I'm greatly afraid our friend is not nineteen carat. Damn it, I can understand a fellow being hard up. But what I can't understand is a fellow sponging. Couldn't he have some spark of manhood about him? He doesn't get a warm welcome from me when he comes, said the old man. Let him work for his side, and not come spying around here. I don't know, said Mr. O'Connor dubiously, as he took out cigarette papers and tobacco. I think Joe Hines is a straight man. He's a clever chap, too, with the pen. Do you remember that thing he wrote? Some of these hillsiders and fenians are a bit too clever, if you ask me, said Mr. Henchy. Do you know what my private and candid opinion is about some of those little jokers? I believe half of them are in the pay of the castle. There's no knowing, said the old man. Oh, but I know it for a fact, said Mr. Henchy. They're castle hacks. I don't say Hines. No, damn it, I think he's a stroke above that. But there's a certain little nobleman with a cock eye. You know the patriot I'm alluding to? Mr. O'Connor nodded. There's a lineal descent of Major Sir, if you like. Oh, the heart's blood of a patriot. That fellow now, that'd sell his country for four pence, aye, and go down on his bended knee and thank the almighty Christ he had a country to sell. There was a knock at the door. Come in, said Mr. Henchy. A person resembling a poor clergyman, or a poor actor, appeared in the doorway. His black clothes were tightly buttoned on his short body, and it was impossible to say whether he wore a clergyman's collar or a layman's, because the collar of his shabby frock coat, and the uncovered buttons of which reflected the candlelight, was turned up above his head. He wore a round hat of hard black felt. His face, shining with raindrops, had the appearance of damp yellow cheese, save where two rosy spots indicated the cheekbones. He opened his very long mouth suddenly to express disappointment and at the same time opened wide his very bright blue eyes to express pleasure and surprise. "'Oh, Father Keon,' said Mr. Henchy, jumping up from his chair, "'is that you? Come in!' "'No, no, no, no,' said Father Keon quickly, pursing his lips as though he were addressing a child. "'Won't you come in and sit down?' "'No, no, no,' said Father Keenan, speaking in a discreet, indulgent, velvety voice. Don't let me disturb you now. I'm just looking for Mr. Fanning. He's round at the Black Eagle, said Mr. Henchy. But won't you come in and sit down a minute? No, no, thank you. It was just a little business matter, said Father Keenan. I thank you indeed. He retreated from the doorway, and Mr. Henchy, seizing one of the candlesticks, went to the door to light him downstairs. Oh, don't trouble, I beg. No, but the stairs is so dark. No, no, I can see. Thank you indeed. Are you all right now? All right, thanks. Thanks. Mr. Henchy returned with the candlestick and put it on the table. He sat down again at the fire. There was a silence for a few moments. Tell me, John, 
said Mr. O'Connor, lighting his cigarette with another pasteboard card. Hmm. What is he exactly? <laughs> Ask me an easier one, said Mr. Henchy. Fanning and himself seem to me very thick. They're often in Kavanaugh's together. Is he a priest at all? Hmm, yes, I believe so. I think he's what you call a black sheep. We haven't many of them, thank God, but we have a few. He's an unfortunate man of some kind. And how does he knock it out? asked Mr. O'Connor. That's another mystery. Is he attached to any chapel, or church, or institution, or... No, said Mr. Henchy. I think he's traveling on his own account. God forgive me, he added. I thought he was the dozen of stout. Is there any chance of a drink itself? asked Mr. O'Connor. I'm dry, too, said the old man. I asked that little shoe-boy three times, said Mr. Henchy. Wouldn't he send up a dozen of stout? I asked him again now, but he's leaning on the counter in his shirt-sleeves, having a deep goster with Alderman Cowley. Why didn't you remind him? said Mr. O'Connor. Well, I couldn't go over while he was talking to Alderman Cowley. I just waited till I caught his eye and said, about that little matter I was speaking to you about before. That'll be all right, Mr. H., he said. Yeah, I'm sure the little hop o' my thumb is forgotten all about it. There is some deal on in that quarter, said Mr. O'Connor thoughtfully. I saw the three of them hard at it yesterday at Suffolk Street Corner. I think I know the little game they're at, said Mr. Henchy. You must owe the city fathers money nowadays if you want to be made Lord Mayor. Then they'll make you Lord Mayor. My God, I'm seriously thinking of becoming a city father myself. What do you think? Would I do the job? Mr. O'Connor laughed. <laughs> as far as owing money goes. Driving out of the mansion house, said Mr. Henchy, and all my vermin, with Jack here standing up behind me in a powdered wig, eh? <laughs> and make me your private secretary, John. Yes, and I'll make Father Keon my private chaplain. We'll have a family party. Faith, Mr. Henchy, said the old man. You keep a better style than some of them. I was talking one day to old Keegan the porter. And how do you like your new master, Pat, says I to him. You haven't much entertaining now, says I. Entertaining, he says. He'd live on the smell of an oil rag. And do you th know what he told me? Now I declare to God I didn't believe him. What, said Mr. Henchy and Mr. O'Connor. He told me, what do you think of a Lord Mayor of Dublin sending out for a pound of chops for his dinner? How's that for high living, he says. Wisha, wisha, says I. A pound of chops, says he, coming into the mansion house. Wisha, says I. What kind of people is going at all now? At this point there was a knock at the door, and a boy put in his head. What is it? said the old man. From the Black Eagle, said the boy, walking in sideways and depositing a basket on the floor with a noise of shaken bottles. The old man helped the boy to transfer the bottles from the basket to the table, and counted the full tally. After the transfer, the boy put his basket on his arm and asked, Any bottles? What bottles? said the old man. "'Won't you let us drink them first? asked Mr. Henchy. "'I was told to ask for the bottles.' "'Come back tomorrow,' said the old man. "'Here, boy,' said Mr. Henchy. "'Will you run over to O'Farrell's and ask him to lend us a corkscrew? "'For Mr. Henchy, say. "'Tell him we won't keep it a minute. "'Leave the basket here.' "'The boy went out, and Mr. Henchy began to rub his hands cheerfully, saying, "'Ah, well, he's not so bad after all. "'He's as good as his word, anyhow.' "'There's no tumblers,' said the old man. "'Oh, don't let that trouble you, Jack,' said Mr. Henchy. "'Many the goods man before now drank out of the bottle.' "'Anyway, it's better than nothing,' said Mr. O'Connor. "'He's not a bad sort,' said Mr. Henchy. "'Only Fanning has such a loan of him. "'He means well, you know, in his own tin-pot way.' "'The boy came back with the corkscrew. "'The old man opened three bottles "'and was handing back the corkscrew "'when Mr. Henchy said to the boy, would you like a drinks, boy? If you please, sir, said the boy. The old man opened another bottle grudgingly and handed it to the boy. What age are you? he asked. Seventeen, said the boy. As the old man said nothing further, the boy took the bottle and said, Here's my best respects, sir, to Mr. Henchy. Drank the contents, put the bottle back on the table, wiped his mouth with his sleeve. Then he took up the corkscrew and went out the door sideways, muttering some form of salutation. "'That's the way it begins,' said the old man. 
the thin edge of the wedge, said Mr. Henchy. The old man distributed the three bottles, which he had opened, and the men drank from them simultaneously. After having drank, each placed his bottle on the mantelpiece within hand's reach, and drew in a long breath of satisfaction. Well, I did a good day's work today, said Mr. Henchy after a pause. That's so, John. Yes, I got him one or two sure things in Dawson Street, Crofton and myself. Between ourselves, you know. Crofton, he's a decent chap, of course, but he's not worth a damn as a canvasser. He hasn't a word to throw to a dog. He stands and looks at the people while I do the talking. Here two men entered the room. One of them was a very fat man, whose blue serge clothes seemed to be in danger of falling from his sloping figure. He had a big face, which resembled a young ox's face in expression, staring blue eyes and a grizzled mustache. The other man, who was much younger and frailer, had a thin, clean-shaven face. He wore a very high double collar and a wide-brim bowler hat. "'Hello, Crofton,' said Mr. Henchy to the fat man. "'Talk of the devil!' "'Where did the booze come from?' asked the young man. "'Did the cow calve?' <laughs> "'Oh, of course.' "'Lions spots the drink first thing,' said Mr. O'Connor, laughing. "'Is that the way you chaps canvass?' asked Mr. Lyons. "'And Crofton and I out in the cold and rain looking for votes?' "'Why, blast your soul,' said Mr. Henchy. "'I'd get more votes in five minutes than you'd two get in a week.' "'Open two bottles of stout, Jack,' said Mr. O'Connor. "'How can I?' said the old man. "'When there's no corkscrew. "'Wait, wait now.' said Mr. Henchy, getting up quickly. Did you ever see this little trick? He took two bottles from the table, and carried them to the fire, and put them on the hob. Then he sat down again by the fire, and took another drink from his bottle. Mr. Lyons sat at the edge of the table, pushing his hat towards the nape of his neck, and began to swing his legs. Which is my bottle? he asked. This lad, said Mr. Henchy. Mr. Crofton sat down on a box, and looked fixedly at the other bottle on the hob. He was silent for two reasons. The first reason, sufficient in itself, was that he had nothing to say. The second reason was that he considered his companions beneath him. He had been a canvasser for Wilkins, the conservative, but when the conservatives had withdrawn their man, and choosing the lesser of two evils, given their support to the nationalist candidate, he had been engaged to work for Mr. Tierney. In a few minutes, an apologetic <coughs> was heard as the cork flew out of Mr. Lyon's bottle. Mr. Lyons jumped off the table, went to the fire, took his bottle, and carried it back to the table. I was just telling them, Crofton, said Mr. Henchy, that we got a few good votes today. Who did you get? asked Mr. Lyons. Well, I got Parks for one, and I got Atkinson for two, and got Ward of Dawson Street. Fine old chap he is, too. Regular old toff. Old conservative. But isn't your candidate a nationalist? said he. A respectable man, said I. He's in favor of whatever will benefit this country. He's a big ratepayer, I said. He has extensive house property in the city, and three places of business, and isn't it to his own advantage to keep down the rates? He's a prominent and respected citizen, said I, and a poor law guardian, and he doesn't belong to any party, good, bad, or indifferent. That's the way to talk to him. And what about the address to the king, said Mr. Lyons, after drinking and smacking his lips? Listen to me, said Mr. Henchy. What we want in this country is, as I said to old Ward, is capital. The king's coming here will mean an influx of money into the country. The citizens of Dublin will benefit by it. Look at all the factories down by the quays there. Idle! Look at all the money there is in this country. If we only worked the old industries, the mills, the shipbuilding yards and factories, it's capital we want. But look here, John, said Mr. O'Connor, why should we welcome the King of England? Didn't Parnell himself? Parnell, said Mr. Henchy, is dead. Now, here's the way I look at it. Here's the chap come to the throne after his old mother keeping him out of it till the old man was gray. He's a man of the world, and he means well by us. He's a jolly, fine, decent fellow, if you ask me, and no damn nonsense about him. He just says to himself, the old one never went to see these wild Irish. By Christ, I'll go myself and see what they're like. And are we going to insult the man when he comes over on a friendly visit? Eh? Isn't that right, Crofton? Crofton nodded his head. 
but after all now said mr lyons argumentatively king edward's life you know is not the very let bygones be bygones said mr henchy i admire the man personally he's just an ordinary knockabout like you and me he's fond of his glass of grog and he's a bit of a rake perhaps and he's a good sportsman damn it can't we irish play fair that's all very fine said mr lyons but look at the case of parnell now in the name of god said mr henchy where's the analogy between the two cases what i mean said mr lyons is that we have our ideals why now would we welcome a man like that do you think now after what he did parnell was a fit man to lead us and why then would we do it for edward the seventh this is parnell's anniversary said mr o'connor and don't let us stir up any bad blood we can all respect him now that he's dead and gone even the conservatives he added turning to mr crofton the tardy cork flew out of mr crofton's bottle mr crofton got up from his box and went to the fire after he returned with his capture he said in a deep voice our side of the house respects him because he was a gentleman right you are crofton said mr henchy fiercely he was the only man who could keep that bag of cats in order down ye dogs lie down ye curs that's the way he treated them come in joe come in he called out catching sight of mr hines in the doorway mr hines came in slowly open another bottle of stout jack said mr henchy oh i forgot there's no corkscrew here show me one here and i'll put it on the fire the old man handed him another bottle and he placed it on the hob sit down joe said mr o'connor we were just talking about the chief ay ay said mr henchy mr hines sat on the side of the table near mr lyons but said nothing there's one of them anyhow said mr henchy that didn't renege him by god i'll say that for you joe no by god you stuck to him like a man oh joe said mr o'connor suddenly give us that thing you wrote do you remember have you got it on you oh ay said mr henchy give us that did you ever hear that crofton listen to this now splendid thing go on said mr o'connor fire away joe mr hines did not seem to remember at once the piece to which they were alluding but after reflecting a while he said oh that thing is it sure that's old now out with it man said mr o'connor shh shh said mr henchy now joe mr hines hesitated a little longer and then amidst the silence he took off his hat laid it on the table and stood up he seemed to be rehearsing the piece in his mind after a rather long pause he announced the death of parnell sixth october eighteen ninety one he cleared his throat once or twice and then began to recite he is dead our uncrowned king is dead o aaron mourn with grief and woe for he lies dead whom the fell gang of modern hypocrites laid low he lies slain by the coward hounds he raised to glory from the mire and aaron's hopes and aaron's dreams perished upon her monarch's pyre in palace cabin or in cot the irish heart wherever it be is bowed with woe for he is gone who would have wrought her destiny he would have had his errand famed the green flag gloriously unfurled her statesmen bards and warriors raised before the nations of the world he dreamed alas twas but a dream of liberty but as he strove to clutch that idol treachery sundered him from the thing he loved shame on the coward caitiff hands that smote their lord or with a kiss betrayed him to the rabble rout of fawning priests no friends of his may everlasting shame consume the memory of those who tried to befoul and smear the exalted name of one who spurned them in his pride he fell as fall the mighty ones nobly undaunted to the last and death has now united him with aaron's heroes of the past no sound of strife disturb his sleep calmly he rests no human pain or high ambition spurs him now the peaks of glory to obtain they had their way they laid him low 
but aaron list his spirit may rise like the phoenix from the flames when breaks the dawning of the day the day that brings us freedom's reign and on that day may aaron well pledge in the cup she lifts to joy one grief the memory of parnell mr hines sat down on the table when he had finished his recitation there was a silence and then a burst of clapping even mr lyons clapped the applause continued for a little time when it had ceased all the auditors drank from their bottles in silence the cork flew out of mr hines bottle but mr hines remained sitting flushed and bareheaded on the table he did not seem to have heard the invitation good man joe said mr o'connor taking out his cigarette papers and pouch the better to hide his emotion what do you think of that crofton cried mr henchy isn't that fine what crofton said that it was a very fine piece of writing End of Story 12 Ivy Day in the Committee Room